Condoleezza Rice, you've described September 11 as a day when the darkly possible became a horrific reality. A day, no doubt, that scorched in your mind. What were you doing when you got the news and how did it hit you? I was standing at my desk in the west wing of the White House getting ready to go down to my uh, meeting with my senior staff and my executive assistant came in and said, a plane has hit the World Trade Center. And I thought, what a strange accident. And so I called the president who was at an education event in Florida and uh, he said the same thing, what a strange accident. A little later on, I went down to my senior staff meeting, and uh, the executive assistant handed me a note, and it said a second plane had hit the World Trade Center, and I thought, my God, this is a terrorist attack. And the next few hours are like a blur. I remember going into the situation support room to try to reach the National Security Council principals to get them together, and turning around, and there uh, was a picture on television of a plane having hit the Pentagon. So you had no inkling of what was, of, of those other elements that no, might unfold? No, and And for several hours, the most difficult thing is that we didn't know what else was coming because uh, there were planes still in the air. We were trying to ground civil aviation. There were still planes in the air. Some were supposedly not responding properly to uh, command to, to go to the ground. So it was a very tense environment. Moments of great human tragedy often strike with a great sense of unreality. Do you, did you feel that you were operating in an environment of unreality? I certainly felt that I was operating in an environment of unreality. I, I'm a specialist in international politics. I've done dozens of simulations of crisis and war. I worked for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I've been on the National Security Council before. You go through crisis simulations in which something awful happens and you have to manage it. But it's never the but same. But it's never the same. And I have to admit that I felt a, a bit like I was floating out of my own body watching some of this. And as I got down to the bunker, when, when the plane hit the Pentagon, the Secret Service came in and they said, there is a plane headed for the White House, we believe. You have to go to the bunker. The vice president is already there. And when I got there and uh, saw the vice president, um, I started to do the things that you have to do to manage a crisis. But I have to say that it, it still, still seems like uh, an experience that happened to someone else. It must have been a particularly deep shock when the most powerful military machine that the world has ever seen was struck at its heart. It was first and foremost a shock that we were so vulnerable. It was secondly, of course, a shock that people using um, means that cost them, as the president has said, less than the cost of a single tank could inflict such danger. And third, it was, it was a surprise. And uh, though we knew a great deal about al-Qaeda, we knew that they were trying to hurt us, uh, it was still a surprise how they did it. And it's an important warning to all of us that uh, surprise is always a factor in major no attacks, well no, matter how well, no matter how well prepared you may think you are. I know that you've had no confirmation one way or the other, or I don't think you have, but do you believe that it is likely that Osama bin Laden is dead? I really don't know if he's dead or alive. Uh, the president may have put it best when she said, if he's alive, we'll still get him, and if he's dead, then we got him. Uh, I think we just have to assume that we don't know. The key is to make sure that the al-Qaeda network is, uh, is disrupted. Al uh, Osama bin Laden, of course, we'd all like to, quote, get him. But uh, this was never a one-man network, and every leader that we wrap up, every command and control installation that we destroy, is one less uh, ability, one less capability for al-Qaeda to do the sort of thing that it did on 9-11. Iraq is now clearly back in America's sights after September 11. What does Iraq have to do with September 11? Well, we had a problem with Iraq before September 11th. We have a problem with Iraq after September 11th. But perhaps we see it with a little more clarity now, what it means to have a, a threat that's out there lurking, a uh, hostile threat to the United States and uh, not to be able to get to that threat before it gets to you. I do think that it's given um, a new clarity to the real nightmare, which would be the uh, joining together of uh, weapons of mass destruction in the hands of uh, tyrants with the threat that is terrorism. 
in and of themselves, these are important and uh, devastating threats, terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. If they were ever to come together, it would make September 11th uh, look, uh, look like child's play. And so uh, I do think we've had a, a new clarity of purpose about Iraq, but Iraq has been a problem for the international community since 1991 and all of the years in between in which Saddam Hussein has been, uh, has been flaunting his international obligations undertaken after he lost the Gulf War. You've said there's a powerful moral case for action now against Iraq. But before you act, don't you have a moral imperative also to show clear proof that Saddam Hussein is doing what you suspect he's doing? What we have a moral imperative to do is to be certain that uh, the United States, with all of its uh, great power at this point, is uh, leading, leaving a secure environment and uh, a peaceful environment. The burden of proof for what Saddam Hussein is or is not possessing is not on the United States or e Australia even, even or in the, the case UN. Of potentially preemptive action. The Saddam Hussein signed on in 1991 to a disarmament regime. He said that he was prepared to let the world uh, employ methods, inspections, to show that he was not continuing his production of weapons of mass destruction. There is no doubt that he has produced weapons of mass destruction. There is no doubt that he has used them. He is the only leader, the only regime, his regime is the only one in uh, m many, many years to use a weapon of mass destruction, chemical weapons against his own people. And so he has a history. He said in uh, what he signed on to in order to cease hostilities in 1991 that he would permit the world to see that he was no longer building weapons of mass destruction, that he was no longer building facilities to get them, and then he threw the inspectors out. And for four years, there has been no way to certify uh, that he is disarming. The burden of proof is on him. Well, I think he, he stopped the inspectors going into the presidential palaces, and the inspectors were withdrawn. He did not do what he said he was going to do, which was that he would allow any time, any place, inspectors to certify that he was disarming. Now, we can all say, well, you know, perhaps he needed the hotel space, so he didn't want them there. I mean, come on. Why would he not want inspections of presidential palaces? Because clearly he has something to hide. Dick Cheney, Vice President Dick Cheney, says that a return of UN weapons inspectors to Iraq would provide no assurance of Saddam's compliance with UN resolutions uh, regarding weapons of mass destruction. He says, on the contrary, there's a great danger it would provide false comfort that Saddam was back in his box. Do you agree with that assessment? The President has uh, long said that the issue here is disarmament, not inspections. Inspections are a means to an end. And the Vice President was simply stating a very clear fact, which is that the way that this has been carried out in the past, Saddam Hussein has been able to frustrate inspections. He has been able to conceal. Uh, the inspectors themselves have talked about large, unaccounted for stockpiles of biological and uh, chemical weapons. Uh, this was just a statement of fact. But, but now, uh, Colin Powell uh, um, has just said, and I assume you agree with, with your Secretary of State, that the next step should now be to get weapons inspectors back in. The key is to uh, make certain that he disarms. And uh, weapons, have, inspectors, weapons inspectors may well be, uh, if appropriately uh, doubt, designed and appropriately allowed to do their work, uh, an element of that. But you Colin, Powell, that that Colin, Powell, Colin Powell also said that it is not the case that weapons inspectors in and of themselves will secure this. The United States has a policy of regime change. And that policy says that uh, the place is only going to really be secure, the region is only going to be really secure when you have a regime uh, that will live up to its international obligations. But we have always said that uh, weapons inspections uh, can be an important element of disarmament. They are not an end in themselves. But do you believe, to, to make those weapons inspectors effective, do you believe, as some are suggesting, that they should have strong military backing, some sort of armed inspectorate? Well, we will see. What we do know is that up until now, the inspectors have never been allowed to do their work in a way that, that uh, certified what Saddam Hussein said he was going to is certify. Is that an option, a kind of armed inspector? We will see. But the key here is that the world needs to be certain about the disarmament 
of this regime. And that is not all that Saddam Hussein signed on to. He also signed on to resolutions uh, that he would not threaten the minorities in his country. He continues to do that. The uh, no-fly zones that uh, the United States and Great Britain have been flying to try and enforce UN resolutions, he routinely shoots at our planes. Uh, he's in constant violation of uh, Security Council resolutions. Do you also agree with, uh, with Cole and Powell that there must be international uh, coalition agreement before uh, and consensus before a U.S. attack on Iraq. Well, I'm not going to, to put words into Secretary Powell's mouth, and I think we have to be careful here. Uh, I will say that the President has said, and the Secretary fully agrees, uh, that the United States will seek international support for uh, any of its acts. You only have to look at the way this President went about uh, the Afghanistan operation. Well, he's operation. described that as a glorious coalition, but the signs are there that a glorious coalition going into Iraq might be the, a quite I would, different I would caution. I would caution against trying to read signs. The President has been uh, deliberative in the way that he has dealt with uh, the use of force when he, uh, even though we were brutally attacked, Afghanistan was put together in a deliberative way, an international way, and the president has made clear that he wants to uh, seek the advice of and the support of the international community. Then there are those critics at home like General Scowcroft, uh, General Schwarzkopf, Lawrence Eagleburger, James Baker, the president's Middle East envoy, General Zinni, uh, Henry Kissinger, all voicing to one degree or another concern about military action against Iraq at this time. That must cause you some cause to pause. As the think. President has said, the debate and a healthy debate about the course of action uh, where Saddam Hussein's regime is concerned is to be expected in a democracy and it is a healthy thing. Of course this President is going to consider all of the concerns. Uh, people don't have to tell him that there need to be concerns about how we deal with, uh, with the regime in uh, in Iraq. But I will say this, it is also the case, as the President has made his uh, argument, of starting with the State of the Union, that there are considerable risks to inaction as well. General uh, Zinni says that war against Iraq would be unwise for a whole raft of reasons. He's your envoy to the Middle East. He says, quote, it's pretty interesting that all the generals see it the same way and all the others who've never fired a shot and are, not, and are hot to go to war, see it another way. Is General Zinni Well, I, I'm not going to, uh, to deal in the hyperbole in which General Zinni uh, is apparently quoted there. I will just say that this is a deliberative president who will look at the options available to us, who will consult with the Congress, who will consult with our allies, and who will uh, decide a course of action. Is it but conceivable let's be, that let's you could be, go into Iraq be, without UN let's be support? Very, let's be very realistic here. We are dealing with a considerable threat to peace and stability in the region, a considerable threat to the interests of the United States, and if we let this threat go unaddressed, a considerable threat to the United States and to its security. It, that is something that the American president cannot allow to stand, and the only decision that the president has made is that uh, the status quo is unacceptable. How close do you believe the President is to making a firm decision on Iraq? The President will make his decision when he makes his decision. Condoleezza Rice, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you very much.